My name is Ira Lesser. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist. I work at Harbor UCLA, one of UCLA's hospitals. Um, welcome. What, what I'd like this to be is as interactive as you're comfortable having it. Uh, I have slides and I can go through as to organize things, but I think really it's much better if we have a discussion about things. Uh, nobody has to talk if they don't want to, but if there are things you want to share, that would be great. Um, sort of the overall talk is about um, sort of quality of life and, and about being resilient. Uh, and so what I'd like to sort of talk about is, you know, first, what, what do I mean by resilience and how might we understand resilience? A little bit about personal accounts of people who have had NMO and have written about their experience in the literature. And then to the extent that you're, pos that you're comfortable, maybe sharing a little bit about what you've experienced, either as somebody with NMO or caring for a relative or a loved one who's had that. And again, nobody has to do that, but if you're comfortable, we could do that. And then I want to talk a little bit about how sometimes some of the emotions that are part of having a disorder like this actually can get significantly worse and may lead us to think that there is a more sustained depression or anxiety and, and what might be some of the symptoms about that and then how those disorders can be treated. And then finally, towards the end, we'll talk about strategies for uh, self-care, for reducing stress and for increasing resilience. And again, please, any questions or comments, please do that. So, what, you know, the word resilience it can be defined in a lot of different ways. And one of it, it's typically de defined as the capacity to bounce back after some adverse event. Now, we all have adversity in our lives. We have deaths of, of loved ones, we have disappointments, we might have medical illnesses. We all suffer that, uh, and having a reaction to that is entirely appropriate and normal. The question is, can we bounce back from it? And that's what resilience is, to get back to where we were before this event occurred. And, the and it's sort of the second way is to withstand the adversity and bounce back despite life's downturns. And there's many ways of thinking about resilience. I like this because it has a couple of components that really can make sense to people. So one is self-awareness. So that means really to, to take stock of where we are, to, to look inward, to get a sort of a, a temperature of where we're at at a given moment. Having purpose, some purpose in life. That could be a spiritual purpose, it can be a purpose in work, something that can guide you and that can lead you to move forward. Um, mindfulness, I'm gonna talk about mindfulness again later. By mindfulness I mean paying attention to where you are in the moment. You know, lots of times, we, we, you know, life is very complicated and things impinge on us from all sorts of things. But being able to sort of let that go for a little bit and just focus on where you are, who you are, and you don't have to deal with that other stuff. That can be very, very empowering and, and calming. I talk a lot about relationships. I'm a big person thinking about connections, human connections. These could be relationships of any kind. They could be intimate relationships, family relationships, friends, relationships in a spiritual sense, relationships with groups and foundations, just being connected. Um, and over the last few years with COVID, that's been made much more difficult and people have really suffered not being able to make the connections. And people who did well, or relatively well, forged those connections, whether they were virtual connections online, but connections and being with people who can validate you, very, very important. And then there's the self-care, meaning pay attention to yourself and feel that you deserve to take care of yourself. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these as we go along. So for a patient with chronic illness, re resilience is really the ability 
to overcome some of the feelings that people with chronic illness often have. There's often sadness. There's often grief about what I can't do anymore. There's often um, uh, the stress of, of, of dealing with the illness. And so resilience, again, is not to say I shouldn't feel these things because nobody should tell you what you should or shouldn't feel. All feelings are appropriate if they're your feelings. Okay, so we're not saying you shouldn't feel them, but the goal is to, despite them, to be able to move on in whatever way that, that makes sense to you. So it doesn't mean that the person shouldn't or, or doesn't feel distress or emotion. It really does mean the goal is to go beyond that and achieve whatever kind of goal one wants. So this is a, a quote from, from a, an article, a woman who wrote about, about NMO. Um, and, and look at the second paragraph. She said, NMO and vision loss have taught me it's okay to ask for support. I've learned that most people are willing to assist and that if you express gratitude, they're even happier. In that one paragraph is a bunch of the stuff about resilience earlier. It's about connectedness. It's about recognizing what you need so that the self-care, I need help, and expressing gratitude, which is sort of having a purpose and, and making connections with other people. I'm going to skip this one because it's less relevant. So I don't know if anybody is comfortable um, sharing, I mean, it's a small group and you may or may not feel comfortable, about some of the emotional reactions that either you've had as a patient with NMO or as a relative or family member. Any, anybody feel comfortable? Please. Right, right. Sure. It's like in making a answering a question or making a comment out of the global situation come out to probably understand the reactions, but I feel sadness when that reaction Yeah, so that you you know the, the big picture. And, and right, and, and, and it takes work on your part or the caregiver's part to sort of not take that personally as a as an indictment of of all the things you don't do. But but it, it's but it's you know that's very common in, in in people who are caregivers. You know they do they do they do, and the one time they didn't do something or forgot, you know that's the point that that people talk about. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Please. I guess after being diagnosed with NMO, uh, my main feeling is I get very frustrated uh -huh. because there's so much I'd like to do that I did before that I can't do. I can't do, or I, right. I can do it, but it takes everything I have to to be able to complete a task. Sure. So it's very frustrating. Very frustrating, and there is some almost grieving in a sense of the, the loss of what I used to do and I can't do anymore. Uh, and that's hard. And, and it's an active process of uh, maybe I can't do that, but let's see what it is that I can do. You know, that's, that's the resilience part. Recognizing I can't do whatever, feeling badly, grieving it, and then somehow trying to say, okay, if I can't do that, maybe I could do this, and you choose something that is more attainable. But I think that's a major part of, of, of people with any variety of chronic illnesses is, is the frustration of what used to be. Um, the goal is recognize that and then see if you can move forward, which is not always easy. It's easy to say, but much more difficult to do. Yeah, th thank you for, for that. And, and we, yes, please.
Uh huh. Wow. 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 Nobody could understand You bet. Right. <laughs> right. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Huh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Those are both tears of, of joy and tears of what you went through at the same time. So that must have been quite, a, quite an experience for you. Yeah. Well, thank you. A anybody else? Guilt. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> sure, right. Yeah. It's easier to tell them to do it and not, right. not for yourself. No, but, but, but you're right. And that's a, that's a totally human reaction, you know. And, and, and again, it requires thinking about it, as you obviously have done, and coming to some understanding that it is okay. You know, it's not an all or none. You know, you're not out every night, you know, doing whatever. But, but, but I think that that is part and parcel. And I'll show you the slide because it talks about guilt and frustration. And yes, please. Right. Uh huh. Right. 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 Sure. Right. Uh -huh. Appreciate that. And, and that is another definition of resilience, basically, that you, you were there and you overcame it, and, and now you're in a whole different place and can look back, but, and, and feeling gratitude is a very big part of it, and sharing the gratitude with, with, with those you love. So again, this is a list, and you've, you've talked a lot about these already. Certainly the sadness and the depression, maybe some hopelessness. Will it ever get better? Um, anger. Why me? Why did this happen to me? You know, what did I do to deserve this? Can't be, nobody to be angry at, but people have feelings of anger. Guilt. And guilt is both sides. You talked about a different kind of guilt. There's guilt on the part of somebody who, who is suffering, and maybe they're fearing that they're a burden to others. And then there's guilt on the caregiver's side, who, who is doing whatever they can, and maybe, you know, with a, with, for a moment doesn't get appreciated the way they might want to. And, that, and you know, so there's, it goes both ways. Certainly fear of what might happen next. You know, will I have another episode? You know, that's a, it, it's there. Um, sleep problems can be. Mood swings, people talk about irritability, and one minute somebody's so nice, and the next minute they're, they're down in the dumps, and then they seem to be high. Uh, some people have trouble with their thinking, that their thinking is slowed down. Um, there could be relationship problems. Clearly, you know, relationships are strained when, when one partner has an illness of, of whatever kind, and that, and that often needs to be dealt with. So part of the question is, when do these reactions to the illness, which are appropriate to, to having an illness, become so severe or disabling that they need to be dealt with in a different way? As opposed to saying, well, we understand be, that because of this, you feel this way and that way. But what about people whose depression becomes much more serious, where they can't get out of bed, where they can't do the kind of work that they want to do, or they can't go to school, or they're thinking about hurting themselves. That, that's when the depression becomes something that we need to think about treating independently of the NMO or of whatever other chronic disease. Um, and the kinds of disorders that people often talk about fall into two real categories. One is the mood problems, uh, people may develop significant depressions. Uh, some people might develop bipolar disorder, 
where they have mood swings from depression, uh, and then they may become very energized and elated, sort of manic, as we say. Um, and then there are anxiety disorders. Uh, so panic disorder uh, is a very dramatic thing. People have panic attacks where all of a sudden their heart rate goes you know, to 100 or 220, 150. They have trouble breathing. Maybe they get a little dizzy. They feel that, that something terrible is going to happen. The world's going to end. Lasts for maybe five, 10 minutes. Uh, but these can be several times a day. And, and in its worst uh, time, people then begin to curtail the activities that they do because they're afraid of having an attack. So they may become even housebound. So that's panic disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder is more of an ongoing feeling of unease where people just can't get comfortable. They have tightness in their muscles. They may have headaches. They may have breathing problems. It's with them most of the time. Even when things are going OK, they still feel this way. So that's another kind of anxiety disorder. And there's post-traumatic stress disorder, where people who have had some kind of serious adverse event, which might include an illness, might include a hospitalization, or might include other kinds of things, and they continually go back to it in their mind. They, they relive it. They may have nightmares about it, whatever. So these are all psychiatric or mental health disorders, all of which we know how to treat, all of which are treatable. And, and, and if there's one thing I'd like you to take out of here, it's that for people who are suffering, they don't need to suffer alone. There is help available. Sometimes it's hard to access. I get that. It's a separate issue. But there is help available. We know how to deal with these things. And nobody needs to continue to suffer from this. OK? Now, I'm not going to do this talk about, I'm not going to tell you the treatment of depression or anxiety, although I'm happy to answer questions if you have that. But in general, depression can be treated with talk therapy, counseling, psychotherapy. And a very specific kind is what's called cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. And what that does, it's a kind of therapy where the therapist and the client or the patient examine the pattern of thinking that somebody has. Because if you, if you think about it, it's our thoughts that lead to feelings. So if I'm thinking, oh, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I have no friends. You know, if I think all this negative stuff, even if it's not true, I'm going to feel terrible. And the therapist, a good therapist like that, will make me examine those thoughts. Is that real? You t last week you told me you went out you know, with a friend to whatever. How could you say you, you, you have no friends? Nobody likes me. Well, you know, so they, they make you sort of question your own thinking. Uh, and that's incredibly powerful kind of psychotherapy, to be quite honest. So there's different kinds of psychotherapy. There's clearly antidepressant medications, which are very helpful. They don't work for everybody. They may have side effects, but they can be incredibly useful. And in many cases, they can be life-saving. And then we often use them in combination. Um, now, one of the, the problems is some of the treatments for NMO and other chronic diseases, particularly steroid treatments, can actually lead to some of these symptoms. So people on steroids may experience depression as a result of the steroid treatment, or they can experience the other. They can actually experience sort of manic -y kind of behavior. That's a little more tricky um, in terms of trying to modulate and moderate the, the need for the steroids, which, which are clearly that should be paramount, versus the kind of side effects that they have. And that's where it gets a little tricky. But it's important to know that because some people who don't recognize that when they're put on steroids and their mood changes, they don't understand what that's about. And it may clearly be a biochemical kind of a thing. You know, for depression, one always the biggest concern for those of us who work with depressed people is thinking about suicide or having people make suicide attempts. And that's an emergency. That's a medical emergency psychiatric emergency. And so if, if somebody is, is talking like that, that is the time to take that very seriously and get them the help. And again, we know how to deal with that. 
this is the, my favorite slide about anxiety. What if? Oh my God, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? You know, and, and I start to think of one bad thought, and then, oh, then this leads to another thought, and it leads to another thought. And, and it's just, it's what we call catastrophic thinking. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. And the more one thinks like that, the more anxious it becomes. It's the same idea. Our thoughts make us anxious. Um, Yeah, right. And then you say, that's no big deal. Well, that's that's one of the treatments. That's actually exactly what a therapist might do, uh, and, and it and that's a, that's a perfect way of, of countering that. Um, that and the you know you, you say this is gonna what what's the evidence that that's gonna happen or whatever. So you you put it in perspective. That's a wonderful way of putting it in perspective, you know. So, but again. We know how to deal with this. The, these are things that people don't need to suffer alone. And so for treatment of anxiety, people who have, you know, very anxious, they often have shortness of breath or hyperventilate. You could teach people breathing exercises. You could teach them to breathe five minutes a day in a certain kind of way, what's called diaphragmatic breathing. It's very calming. You could do it anywhere you want. You could do it in your home. You could do it outside, you could do it at work, you could do it at school. It doesn't take very much, no tools, no equipment, but you can learn to do that and it actually decreases anxiety. Counseling, again, CBT. And then for, there are medications if the anxiety is severe. We use either antidepressants, which even though they're antidepressants, they work for anxiety just as well. And then there are anti-anxiety medications. Uh, we try to be careful with them because some of them can lead to dependence. Uh, we try to be careful about that, but, but they can be useful as well. And then outside of these disorders, you know, we need to think about if we're going to try to achieve wellness, all the, all the elements of wellness. And, and these are just a few. So clearly there's the physical and the emotional that we've talked about it. But there's also the spiritual, you know, having, a, again, the purpose financial concerns, you know, people who have illness may have financial concerns. So a true approach to wellness is not all at once, but to think about all these different kinds of dimensions. And then there are very specific stress reduction techniques that people can learn um, and, and can have as tools that they can do on their own. I've already mentioned breathing, uh, there's meditation, the mindfulness, again, of centering oneself, of just staying centered. There's guided imagery. A woman who was in, a young woman who was here the previous session talked about her own way of guided imagery. So guided imagery is the kind of thing where you think of a, um, a relaxing and a very pleasant scene or place for you. Some people say, you know, I'm most relaxed if I'm by the water and I hear the waves and I feel the warm sand on my feet. You know, other people might say, I, I like to be in a forest. This young woman said she, would, she imagined she was in Hawaii with a perfect sunset. The, the goal here is you can't be anxious and relaxed at the same time. Your body can't do both, okay? So if you're anxious and you can, in your mind, transport yourself to this pleasant, quiet, peaceful scene, your anxiety will begin to melt away because you can't have this in mind and be anxious at the same time. It takes practice. I mean, it's not just as, as easy as I'm talking about, but people can learn how to do guided imagery. And she was saying, I keep pointing because she was sitting right there. She's not there now. Um, when she gets blood drawn, she doesn't like getting her blood drawn. That's what she does. She sits down in the chair and she gets this image in her head and that allows her to get through that. Um, this is very interesting. Sure. Do you have massage over there? Yeah. Um, when I was having attacks, I would go to the massage parlor and I'd have the massage and I'd have my hands on my stomach and I'd have Yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer for that specifically. I think that people are different. Some people, during an attack or, or feeling a certain way, the, the touch 
trigger something. So it's, this is not really for specific for animal. It's, it's a general, you know, that some people with a lot of muscle tension, a massage can just sort of relax that. So these are, but it's not a specific kind of treatment. I don't mean to say that. You know, yoga or Tai Chi, things that, again, that, that, that we can do on our own to reduce stress. Uh, acupuncture, some people like herbal remedies or herbal teas. They may work for some people, not for others. And then there's the support that's really, really important. Uh, you, you, you talked about that. You would say you, you, you run family groups, you know, both for the patient and for the caregiver to have support, to have a place where you can be validated for how you feel where you can share things and not feel criticized. These are so, so important. Uh, and, and NMO does a superb job with, with, with bringing families together, like this conference today, bringing families together. Um, and and I, I can't stress how important that is to, to decrease the feeling of aloneness, which is, which is really quite terrible. Um, it could be spiritual or religious supports. Again, that's not for everybody, but if it works for somebody, then it's an incredible source of comfort, and, and, that, and that should be utilized. Um, you know, th this is an illness, or any chronic illness can interfere with relationships, marital relationships, intimate relationships, and, and that may need to be worked out as well. I think you should expect certain things from your caregivers. And one is to get good information, to, get, to be spoken to respectfully and, and clearly, um, and to be validated for how you're feeling. Nobody should say, oh, you really shouldn't be feeling that. You know? Or don't feel that way. You know? I mean, that's the worst thing that, could, that somebody could say to somebody. Right? Maybe you, you're, Right. I mean, you know, don't feel that way makes me feel like I'm not heard. I'm not understood. You know, I mean, I can't just, you know, so that you may, I may not like the way I feel, and, and we could talk about that, but people should not have their feelings invalidated. Both ways. Both ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, and if your caregivers are not doing that, Find somebody else. Uh, th there's no reason to tolerate that kind of a thing. Again, if, if the symptoms of anxiety or depression are severe enough that get in the way, think about getting treatment for that independently. And if your caregiver is uncomfortable with that, ask for a referral to somebody who can do that. Um, you know about the foundation and stuff. So Dr. Yeaman, Mike Yeaman, who you all know, is a good friend of mine, gave me this slide. Uh, and this, another definition of resilience, a uh, Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. Okay, just keep going, keep going, despite everything. And this is sort of a, a slide, I actually, we used this a lot when we were talking about COVID, quite honestly. I, I borrowed this slide from a friend of mine, we were doing stuff on COVID, because, you know, it, that was just such a difficult time for everybody, for everybody. Um, but it really talks in the same context that what you were trying to, to attain is a sense of safety at the top, to where we feel in a safe place. And some of the things that can lend itself to that are the connections that I've been talking about, the calming kind of techniques we've been talking about, the self-care, the calm down. That, those lead to what's called self-efficacy, meaning if you can calm yourself down, you now have the tools within yourself, and you feel better, and you feel more empowered, and you feel more competent to be able to handle things. So learning these things can be extremely helpful to people. And once you learn that you can do it, that can instill hope, because now I have the ability to help myself feel better. Well, that can lead to hope. And then that leads to more of a sense of safety. So each of these things sort of interact with, with each other.
Now, okay, I was gonna say now when the slides don't work, the presenter loses hope and starts to get anxious and all that, but <laughs> okay. All right, so what are the sort of the steps that we can try to do for resilience? Well, again, the connections we've talked about. We all have crises in our lives. You know, some are more difficult to deal with than others, but that's the way life is. Uh, I had a mentor once who said, the bumps in the road are the road. The bumps in the road are the road. We all deal with things, and we have to deal with things. And so if we cannot see the bump as totally insurmountable, we know that we can get beyond it. Except that change is part of living. Uh, have goals. Now, maybe the goals should be very small ones, something that you could attain, and, and you build upon that. Not having the goal out here, that's much more difficult. And if you can't get to that one, then you feel defeated. Make a smaller goal. That can be attained, and then you take a goal beyond that. Uh, find meaning, you know, that's very important. That's the first slide about purpose. Uh, keep things in perspective and try to be hopeful to the extent that's possible, uh, and then taking care of yourself.